This is the day that has been given to us. <laughs> and rather than creating it or earning it or deserving it, we receive this day. And even in the moments when it doesn't feel like it, we receive it as a gift, a gift from the universe, a gift from God, a gift from life itself. As we gather together today online and in person, let us receive the gift of this day and make of it a time to recommit to our highest ideals and our deepest commitments. In our freely covenanted faith of Unitarian Universalism, we know that it is the shared commitments of our covenant rather than any creed or belief that bind us together in beloved community that inspire us to faithful service. So as we enter our time of worship this day at the Birmingham Unitarian Church, let us join together in giving voice to the promise of this congregation's covenant. As part of this beloved BUC community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. Good morning.
Oh, good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. It's good to be together again. If you're with us here in the sanctuary or joining us via Zoom, I've got some great news. If you're here, you get free coffee after this service. If you're on Zoom, you get to get your own coffee. But we do invite you to join us in the sanctuary afterwards. Whether you are here or watching this later, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between the people viewing this and the people here. So I'd like to ask you, take a look in the back, see that camera. Let's give everybody a big wave as we pan around and give them a good morning. After that, we will send everybody up on the screen that's on Zoom. And good morning to you as well. Whenever and however you connect with BUC, we are building BUC. And we are building the beloved community. We light the chalice today with words from Reverend Dr. Cynthia Landrum. In honor of those who have served and those who continue to serve at home and abroad for peace and in war, we light our chalice and we offer our thanks. This morning's first hymn will be number 1003 in your teal hymnal. And this is a round with four different parts, so we're going to do a little practice run first. So I invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing with me. I will sing each of the parts once and then you will respond. So here's the first part. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where do we come from? Mystery, mystery, life is a riddle and a mystery, mystery. Mystery, life is a riddle and a mystery. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Beautiful. Now we will sing it all together with me at the piano and you are welcome to sing just as we did in the order of the parts or choose your favorite part and sing that throughout.
This is a story about John. John was a thin, pale boy with brown hair that hung down to his waist. Sometimes he tied it up in a ponytail. People meeting John for the first time often thought he was a girl, but that didn't seem to bother him. He was worried more about his physical health anyway. He was born with cystic fibrosis, which is a disease that makes it hard to breathe. The lungs get clogged and have to be cleared from time to time. Being short of breath makes it difficult to be physically active, like playing basketball or hiking. And cystic fibrosis is a disease that has no known cure, at least for now. And it can get worse and worse as people get older. And sadly, many people with cystic fibrosis have passed away at a very young age. John couldn't do a lot of things most children do, but he decided to enjoy the things that he could. He collected bears, stuffed bears, carved bears, teddy bears, and he read a lot. He especially liked to read about Unitarian and Universalist history. He wanted to be a Unitarian Universalist minister someday. The people in his church called him their minister in training. John took this vote of confidence very seriously. Beginning when he was 12, he would preach in his church from time to time. When he led the Sunday service, he spoke about what it was like to grow up with an illness that limited the things he could do and how it was possible to be happy under these conditions. He gave people hope and he made them, made them glad they came to hear him. Everyone was happy when John preached. John joined the Boy Scouts when he was 12, traveled up the ladder to become an Eagle Scout, and went on to receive the Order of the Arrow, the Boy Scouts' highest achievement. As part of the requirement for Eagle Scout rank, John had to plan a major project. He had seen a memorial wall at another Unitarian Universalist church, much like our Memorial Glen in Chopic Woods. He saw the little plaques with the names of those who had died and the years they had lived. John wanted to create a memorial wall and garden for his church too. First, he had to go to the leaders of the church to get their approval. Because he was able to explain so clearly what a memorial wall was and why he wanted to build one, the church board enthusiastically said yes to his project. Then John got the help of other adults in the church, an artist to design the wall, a landscaper to plan the garden uh, surrounding the wall, and some workers to actually build the wall and plant that garden. Plaques with names of church members and their loved ones who had died were hung on the wall, and a fountain-shaped chalice was placed in the center of a small garden of green plants. John included a larger plaque at the end of the wall, displaying a quote by Norman Cousins. The plaque said, memory is where the proof of life is stored. John thought these words would comfort people who had lost loved ones. To John, these words meant that people don't just die and become forgotten. Instead, we remember the people who are close to us because they change our lives. When the memorial wall was completed and the planting set in, John asked his Boy Scout troop to build a walkway from the church building to the wall, a distance of about 150 feet. Although John could not dig the dirt or pour the cement because of his illness, he was still with his troop the entire time and they were working and while they were working and he was encouraging his buddies and thanking them for their help john loved the scouts he enjoyed earning badges because they helped him learn a lot about different things how to build fires how to camp safely and how to have a good time with friends but after he received the order of the arrow he discovered something that made him stop and think. He learned that, at that time, the Boy Scouts of America did not allow people who were gay or people who did not believe in God to be scouts or scout leaders. John checked with his scoutmaster to make sure these rules were real. When it was confirmed, he quit scouting. He quit because, as a Unitarian Universalist, he believed in the worth and dignity of every person that each and every person is important. This is a lesson that the Boy Scouts have been learning for a long time, 
And although some changes have come as a result of others speaking up, there's still some work to be done to widen the circle and include more folks in the Boy Scouts program. John died just a few weeks before his 17th birthday and well before the more recent changes in the Boy Scouts policies. At his memorial service, which recognized his death and celebrated his life, every seat in the church sanctuary was taken and there were people standing in the aisles. During the service, John's friends and family talked about how they would remember him. Some of the best speeches of all came from the members of John's old Boy Scout troop, who said, John taught me a lot. He was a good scout, and I hope I can live my life as truthfully as John did. John was a young person who truly acted on his Unitarian Universalist beliefs. Many who knew him remember John well, not because he died young, but because of the way he used his 16 years of life, and they try to live as honestly and as joyfully as he did. Finally, ha, we come to a time in our service for showing our gratitude and helping to build the beloved Birmingham Unitarian Church community. We encourage living lives of integrity, learning, service, joy. One way we live this is by giving half of our weekly offering to a cause chosen by the congregation in one of the areas that we hold in value. Environmental action, economic justice, civil engagement, racial justice. Every month we support a new organization. This month it is Michigan Liberation's Black Mama's Bailout Project. Cash bail has criminalized poverty and keeps 8,000 Michiganders in jail every night simply because they can't afford bail. Very often this is for nonviolent charges, traffic offenses, petty theft. In the month of May, we honor mothers, and we are now honoring the nonprofit organization, Michigan Liberation, on our, and their request for donations for the, their Black Mamas Bailout Initiative. This money is used to post bail for mothers who are caught in the discriminatory cash bail system. When a person appears in court on their scheduled date, the bail money is returned and gets used again for another person's bailout. BUC has been working with, the Michigan, Libera with Michigan Liberation since 2022. This organization is dedicated to achieving peace, wellness, and justice for black and brown communities in Michigan. Help us free mothers to return home to their children. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world 
we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we accept and dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Thank you. We practice our spirituality in many ways, individually and collectively. Uh, let's begin with sharing uh, together as part of that practice, the joys and sorrows that may uh, draw us together. Now, I do wanna first confirm, is it accurate that there were no written joys or sorrows this morning, asking the ushers? There were none. There was one shared online And this comes, excuse me, this is from Ashby and Alex Wolf. And they note that they are lifting up not a specific event, but just acknowledging the joy that our mom, Barbara Wolf, gives us and her family as she tackles life struggles with bravery and love. In all the sorrows and all the joys of our lives, the ones we express and those we have not yet shared, may we be present with one another in this beloved community of care and of support. Now today is the fourth Sunday of the month and yes, we do have our tradition of lighting memorial candles. Just before we start that, I want to also note because this is also Memorial Day weekend, we are also having an annual tradition today. Shortly after the service in the sanctuary concludes, uh, you'll be invited to gather in the Memorial Glen that was mentioned earlier in Chopek Woods uh, behind the church building, where we will be remembering those beloved members of BUC who have died in the last year. We will begin this exactly 15 minutes after the conclusion of the service. So we encourage you to join us there. Those who have uh, mobility concerns or other, uh, uh, other uh, ability issues, we do have some seating available and those who are currently able-bodied, we invite you to reserve those seats for those who may need them. But for now, as we do on the fourth Sunday of every month, we light candles to remember those who have died this month, the month of May in any year, be they a member of this church or someone who was important in your life in other ways. 
You're welcome to come forward to light a candle for anyone that you're remembering this day or to light it for a concern that's on your heart. And as you light your candle, you're invited to say the name of who you remember or briefly state any concern that you have. We invite you to come forward in your own time using the aisle closest to the choir loft. Please remember to place your lighted candle as far back in the candle holder as possible to allow room for other candles to be added without people having to reach over flames. And now, a time to share. We begin by lighting a candle from our chalice for the ones who are remembered by those who have joined today's service via Zoom. And I'll add that we invite you to share names or concerns by typing them in the chat so that the, your fellow Zoom participants will share in them as well. For those in the sanctuary, please come forward as, and we light our candles.
we share now a time in a deeper way, a time of prayer, as we prepare to hear these prayerful words by the Reverend Barbara Peskin. I invite you to find yourself reaching deep within, reaching far beyond yourself, and connecting with what you know to be sacred. Spirit of life and love, God known in so many ways, in mystery beyond all knowing, in thanksgiving and in anguish, we bless the poets and those who mourn. Send peace for the soldiers who did not make the wars, but whose lives were consumed by them. Let strong trees grow above graves far from home and breathe through the arms of their branches. The earth will swallow your tears while the dead sing no more, never again. Remember me. For the wounded ones and those who received them back, let there be someone ready when the memories come, when the scars pull and the buried metal moves. And let there be forgiveness for those of us who were not there for our ignorance. And in those who are veterans in a forest of a thousand fallen promises, let new leaves of protest grow on our stumps Give us courage to answer the cry of humanity's pain and with our bare hands, out of full hearts, with all our intelligence, let us create the peace. Blessed may we all be. Amen. And now let us join in a moment of silence. Sing return again. We are, now, we are now entering into a time where we would like to bring the whole congregation together in a way. Research has shown that the pressure and stress leaves an impact on our bodies, our minds, and doing things collectively. It's part of the reason we're here, right? 
brings us together and helps bring us some solace. We constantly face trauma, accelerated levels of change, often without opportunity to process or integrate those. We will, as a congregation, use a mind-body integration practice to help us feel centered and grounded. Close your eyes, soften your gaze, plant your feet, get comfortable. We're going to perform a full body scan. Take notice what it feels like to be in your body. Start at your forehead. How does your forehead feel at the moment? Is there tension? Is it warm? Is it cold? Do you feel any of the hair falling on your forehead? Slowly expand your attention and awareness down to your eyes, your ears, your mouth and jaw. What do these parts of your body feel like right now? Next, consider your shoulders. Is there any tingling, numbness, tension, other sensations, anything in your arms, your hands? How are things today with your chest? And your back? stomach. Continue down the rest of your body. Sinews, muscle, tendons, ending at the tips of your toes. Check in. Look back at some of the other places sometimes. See if there's a relation. Breathe deeply, and we'll come together. I missed that. <laughs> All right. A little out of order today. Apologize. We have a reading today from Norbert Chopik. It is worthwhile to live and fight courageously for sacred ideals. Oh, blow ye evil winds into my body's fire, my soul you'll never unravel. Even though disappointed a thousand times or fallen in the fight and everything would worthless seem, I have lived amidst eternity. Be grateful, my soul, my life was worth living. He who was pressed from all sides but remained victorious in spirit is welcomed into the choir of heroes. He who overcame the fetters giving wing to the mind is entertaining the golden age of the victorious. The basketball court in the gymnasium of West Memphis High School might well be the last place you would expect to find a fully functioning military field hospital. It was certainly the last place I would have expected to find one, and yet, there it was. But when I arrived at the high school, I actually did know what I'd be finding. Indeed, I'd been invited there by somebody I knew. This was a military unit engaging in a training exercise, a military medical unit that was training to set up and operate a field hospital in whatever foreign location might, they might be assigned to at any notice. But for their training exercise, they purposely set up in a place that was economically underserved by the healthcare industry. And West Memphis, Arkansas, just across the river from Memphis, Tennessee, definitely qualified. 
I was serving our church in Memphis at the time, just a few miles away from this high school, when a Unitarian Universalist Army Reserve chaplain, who I knew and who had been assigned to that to be chaplain for that unit, invited me to come out and see it. And it was fascinating as a person without a military background to walk through, with permission, this facility that had been set up so elaborately out of nothing and was offering so much good for the community because it wasn't just a matter of setting it up. They had to make sure they were functioning right. So they made what they had, they made the services they had to offer available for the community offering a full range of medical services, dental services, even some very minor surgical procedures. You could even get free eyeglasses there. They had a system to make eyeglasses. It was an incredible service to the community and uh, a real reminder of the good that can be done by the organized structured work of the United States military in a very different key than many of us often think of them as providing. I got to spend some personal time with my chaplain friend, both there and afterwards. They, he'd had uh, a number of uh, religious res and spiritual resources set up for the service people. He gave me this Jewish prayer book prayer book for Jewish personnel in the armed forces of the United States. Didn't know there were GI Jewish prayer books, did you? Neither did I. And I was pleased, and though not at all surprised, to see that he also had copies of this little meditation manual that the Unitarian Universalist Association put out in 2009 specifically for military service people and their families. It's entitled, Bless All Who Serve, Sources of Hope, Courage, and Faith for Military Personnel and Their Families. Uh, it was edited by uh, my late colleague, Reverend Matthew Tittle, and his spouse, Gail Tittle. I knew them both, and they had both been uh, officers in the U.S. Navy before he became a minister. By the way, the... Uh, the chaplain that I got to spend time with, including inviting him to lunch with me across the river in Memphis. We ate at Elvis's favorite diner, the arcade, was uh, U.S. Army Reserve Chaplain David Pyle. Yeah, that name's, I'm, I can hear that name's familiar to a couple of you. He now serves as the regional lead for the Mid-America region of the Unitarian Universalist Association, uh, count, uh, consulting with congregations, including ours. We are gathered together on this Memorial Day weekend. We are remembering those that we've lost among us, but also taking an opportunity to reflect on uh, what we can be reminded to lift up by the best of military service, understanding that our relationship with such service is appropriately complex, and yet, knowing that there is good to be found in so many of the people who engage in such service and ways that those of us not serving in that context can be inspired to live our lives. So we'll be sharing over the next little bit some reflections that are drawn from this little manual uh, Derek will be reading some, I will as well. And even the hymns that were chosen and the reading you just heard, the prayer that I shared earlier, all those came from this book. May we be inspired by this reflection on service. <laughs>
As Reverend Derek mentioned, he suggested I go out and buy the book, but I, I'm not going to be as humble as him. I'll leave all the bookmarks in from the readings that we were picking through. Uh, this one is by Rebecca Savage from a piece titled Action. Each of these start out with a quote, then a reading, and then a small prayer at the end. We'll be ditching that for the moment. Wherever you go, preach. Use words if necessary. St. Francis of Assisi. Military service is a lesson in humility, in spiritual humility. In our often self-centered culture, the military puts other things over the needs and wants of every single person. The mission comes first. Operational security comes first. As service members, we are each just one cell in a huge organization that is living and breathing. It's easy to get lost as a faceless soldier, just another Joe on a mission. As people of faith, we chose a spiritual path that calls us to be greater than just another Joe. We bring compassion to those who are suffering. We offer acceptance to those who have cast it aside. We befriend those we meet without checking out their political affiliations or religious beliefs first. We give voice to those who are overlooked and oppressed. We open our hearts and our minds to spiritual wisdom from the world's religious traditions. Spiritual humility means putting ourselves aside and watching for opportunities to bring healing to those around us by being the best at the role we are called to play, be it cook, clerk, medic, or infantryman. Whatever you do, radiate your faith in your daily work and life. The smallest act of kindness, of tolerance and respect can make waves in the life of another person. You bring peace into the world through your relationships and how you treat others. Rebecca Savage. <clears throat> Margaret Mead reminds us that we should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And the late Unitarian minister, A. Powell Davies of All Souls Unitarian in Washington, D.C., many decades ago shared this reflection. The American commitment is to universal justice, the rights of all people, not the special interests of some. It's a commitment to fair play, to patience, to tolerance, to neighborliness. It's a commitment to the common good. It protects liberty with unity, the opportunity of each with the good of all. It is compassionate, humanitarian. It believes in humanity and in its future. It is based upon the claim of conscience and the faith in goodness. It begins not in a system, but within the heart. It battles prejudice and false opinion. It seeks the truth. It is opposed to barriers of exclusiveness. Its principles are universal. It despises cowardice. 
including moral cowardice, but it also has no use for obstinacy, inflexibility, and intolerance. It prefers honesty to cleverness, kindness to self-sufficiency, goodwill to narrow-minded aims. It is a way of life now and a faith, a vision of the future. It is a purpose to be served. If anyone asks by what right I define these characteristics as American, I point them to those Americans the rest of us revere as great. I say that America is defined by the moral progress it has sought and by exemplars, not by the hour of perfidy and by its little-minded, greedy foes. And if anyone tells me that these characteristics are more than American, that they are universal, I will reply that that is why they are American, because this nation was not founded on the divisive and separate, but upon the rights of all people. Can we restore these standards? Can we seek again the touch of greatness? The future will depend upon the answer, upon what takes place in heart and conscience. A nation like an individual, must have a soul. Now, we selected an additional hymn for today. We invite you to join together in Guide My Feet. It's number 348 in the gray hymnal, and the words will be on the screen. in recognition of the time, I just want to briefly reflect that we do, as Unitarian Universalists, have a complex history of how we relate to the military. Though Unitarian Universalism has never been a peace faith, one that automatically um, qualifies its adherence to a conscientious objector status with the U.S. military, like the Quakers or the Mennonites, or some other faith traditions like the Baha'i faith. We are nonetheless a religious tradition with a history of negativity, I'd say appropriate negativity toward militarism and towards the wars in which our military has too often been deployed. And yet, over time, and I've been pleased to see this distinction become clearer for many UUs in recent years, we've come to understand how to separate military service people 
from the institution of the military and from the leaders who give their orders. And it has been a treat to see my friends who are uh, in military service and particularly those who serve as chaplains uh, in the armed forces as UU ministers not be automatically rejected by the majority of UUs as would have happened a few decades ago and did happen for the most part. And this Memorial Day is a particular day to remember that. But of course, it's one with a special focus. This is not Veterans Day where we uh, officially honor those who still live, who have a history of serving in the military. It's not Armed Forces Day, which lifts up those currently serving, but it is the day to remember those who have died in their military service. And as Derek and I were preparing for uh, this service today, we were reflecting on the fact that while neither of us have a military background ourselves, we can still admire the that military ethos of rededication of mind to action. And we can recognize with regret that so often that comes from violence while still respecting those soldiers making moral choices to act as best they can and be reminded that sacrificing for a cause is not only a quality we can find in the best of those who served in the military, but in some of the best of those from our own history of Unitarian and Universalism as well. From Michael Servetus being burned at the stake for his anti-Trinitarian beliefs in John Calvin's Geneva, to Dr. Norbert Chopek, whose life ended at Dachau for speaking the truth to his congregation against Nazi oppression, to Reverend James Reeve and Viola Liuzzo, whose lives were ended along with Jimmy Lee Jackson's in Selma, Alabama. And recognizing that while we need not end our lives for such service, we can nonetheless appreciate on this Memorial Day weekend and be inspired to remember those who lived true to their commitments and their values and were inspired by them to live our own lives in greater integrity with our highest aspirations in greater commitment to the service of humanity. So may it be for us all. Let us conclude with a final hymn, Spirit of Life. Please rise. And so as we leave this sacred time, leave the many sacred spaces where we have gathered, may we carry with us the gifts of gratitude for the nurturing of our spirits and community, humility when we fall short of our highest aspirations, and resilience to strengthen our resolve. 
With these, may we go forth to serve this hurting world in the spirit of love. Please join us in the memorial, Glenn, and go in peace. <laughs>